I have a dice tower behind me and you get three rolls on the tower and whatever random questions I roll for you, that's where we start at least. Okay. Can you give me one audition high, but then also tell me about an audition low and how you overcame it or what you learned from it? Interesting, audition high. I think audition high had to be um, Project Power. Uh, I was like, I had to do chemistry tests with Jamie Foxx and I was so nervous and the audition I had to uh, be really emotional. So I didn't know if I wanted to like show my bubbly personality or like just be in character. And like as my car pulled up, Jamie's car pulled up and I came out and I just said, Mr. Jamie Foxx. And he was like, oh, your energy's crazy. And he like, gave me a hug and then went into the audition. Uh, my character raps in a movie that he asked me if I rapped. I said, no, but I'm a spoken word poet. He said, go on, do something for us then. So I get up and I do an original poem called Ode to My Hood about Brooklyn and they just like loved it. And then I didn't get the part, so maybe that's a law. I did not get the part originally. <laughs> wow, how did I not know that? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so I didn't get the part originally and then a whole month later, I got a call from my team saying, actually they do want you for the movie. It didn't work out with somebody else because of scheduling conflicts, so they want you to come to New Orleans. And I thought I was gonna be in New Orleans for like a month and a half. I was there for four months. I was really thrown. So I guess that's a mix. What is your absolute favorite part of the acting process? Prepping for a role, uh, rehearsing, putting your costume on for the first time, but then also what's not necessarily your least favorite, but a part of the process where you see room to grow for yourself and you're eager to tackle that? Oh, uh, I'll start with the one that I'm eager to like grow from. I think I'm such a, I'm, I'm such, I'm such a mommy's girl. You know, I'm, I'm so close to my family. I'm one of 19 grandkids. And uh, it took a, it, it was like a long, my family makes jokes, like they didn't expect me to ever leave my mom, my mom's house and go places. So to have to go away and film for four or five months at a time, and you leave everybody that you love and your home and the things that make you, that help you to feel grounded. So that's kind of hard and I'm, I'm navigating that because as I do more things, it's gonna be, you know, touring and going to different places uh, around the world. So I just gotta kind of get used to that. My favorite part of the acting pro process is finding out just as just how much I could get into a character. I think a lot of times we, you know, as an actor, like, I think I could do that. I want to do that. I hope to be able to do that. Then you get the opportunity and you're like, oh shoot, can I do that? And then you kind of go through the process and you find out at the end that you could. Or maybe it wasn't right for you, but either way you learned something. What artist, sports team, event, whatever it may be, are you most likely to overspend on? <laughs> um, you know, that's such a funny, it's such a funny question because Dre is such a, like, a stan and I just never really been one. I, the first concert I ever saw was in 2018, so imagine, like, going most of my life without ever seeing a concert. Like, ever, ever? Ever. <laughs> what was it? It was actually Jay-Z. <laughs> 444 and I did the music video so that was like a it was like a, a deeper connection and just going to see one but I would have to say I love J. Cole so I'll probably yeah I'll probably just want to buy a ticket to see J. Cole. What is up everyone welcome back to the channel for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night with an old favorite Dominique Fishback is back on the show this time for Swarm congratulations. Thank you thank you so much. My first question for you refers back to pretty much all of our previous conversations because you've always mentioned vision boards. And the last time we spoke, you were telling me about how your vision board making process has evolved and you started to make them using a PDF format instead. So it was making me wonder over the last, I guess it was two years, how has your vision board making process evolved, whether it's from the tech side or just personally for you, what's been going on them lately? Well, it's so funny because for the last about six or seven years, I made a vision board at the end of a year to go into the beginning of the new one. Maybe by like January 3rd, I'm normally finished with it to say this is it. But for the first time, my vision board, I didn't finish it and I didn't feel compelled to like throw stuff on it to like beat some kind of time clock. I just was like, you know what? I did this and I'm just gonna wait it out and, and see. Um, but yeah, I think, I'm, I think I'm more open to not, not controlling things and letting, letting it flow and seeing what happens, I think. I'm someone who's constantly in fear of not finishing things being a bad thing. But yeah. I think that sometimes not finishing things is prioritizing what's most important to self at a yeah. point. 
Yeah, and we're, and like in other ways, I'm I'm working on myself. So maybe this is the first time where the vision board will uh, I will kind of guide the vision board as opposed to the vision board guiding me in some kind of way. And this might be the seventh one. They said seventh is the year of completion, so maybe it's a new way that I'm going to start doing some things. <laughs> I also always love bringing up somebody who studies their craft at school. It's the right path for some, not for others. Yes. Everything is okay. So you got a BA at Pace. I did. Looking oh. back now, what is something that you learned from that program that you still find yourself using and referring back to? But on the other hand, what is something that like all the schooling in the world never would have prepared you for when you hit your very first professional set? I will say the thing that school can't prepare you for is... Uh, like hitting your mark, like we don't talk about that. I mean, the camera's here. You have to walk and not look down and like talk to somebody while it's moving. And you, like you, there's a mark there that you have to hit without looking at it. We don't talk about that. I think we probably should practice that a little bit more in school. Um, the art of like being a movie star versus being an actor, I think that's different. And I think that's important too. A lot of times in school, because they, I think they want to ground you in the craft, they say, that's not important. Fame's not important. Celebrity's not important. And maybe it isn't, but there's also, if you ignore it, then maybe you're not prepared for when it comes. You know what I mean? Oh, that's so, so interesting. I think, uh, but what I love about school um, that I think, I just, I, I think is honestly like knowing your peers and seeing how they evolve and how you can evolve together. I think that's pretty cool. Oh, I second Because otherwise it, it's so singular time. and you're so, it's such an individual experience that imagine me, for example, I did, I was in a theater company and in the same theater company, Dominique Thorne, who plays Riri, uh, Riri Williams, and yes, holla, shout out to her. She's from Brooklyn. She was in the same uh, youth company theater that I was in. And so now to like kind of look across or be in rooms with her and be like, oh, we came from the same, like the same childhood essentially, not exactly, but like the same theater company. And that means a lot. So I think it gives community. Going back to what you just mentioned about celebrity, what would you say is maybe the biggest misconception about wrapping your brain around celebrity versus just craft that you wish more people knew about? Um... There's definitely glamour in the industry, like being an actor. It's glamour you get to wear all these cool things and see all the cool people and go to the premieres and things like that. But also, it's not like, you know, you do 17-hour days on sets. You sometimes do six-day weeks. like And you're, like, you know, doing Transformers. Like, I'm really in the jungle. Like, being afraid of, like, I don't know, poison frogs and... Things like that could kill you in an hour. Like there, there, those. It's real. It's acting, but it is real, and it does take a, a toll. And so sometimes I think one of the hardest things is, you know, we want to act when the camera says, when it says action, but you also end up acting outside of action because if let's say I'm I'm sad today, something happened, but now you have all these people looking to you to give them a good experience of having met you. And they're not wrong for one of that. They've admired you. They've watched you. It's, it's, you know, they want to feel good by meeting you. And also, you're a human. So to, like, act on action, then say cut, and then have to act again and make sure a whole swarm of people, swarm, no pun intended, <laughs> a crew, like, like, like a, a whole crew of different people that, you know, they just want to say hi. And so you try to give them everything that you got and then give everything that you got on screen. And that's not always easy to highlight all the different types of processes there are out there. Can you tell me about one co-star who the second you hit set, you were immediately in sync, but then I want the opposite. Someone who challenged you to adapt and maybe try something new and for the better. Um, <clears throat> I'll say, I'll say Daniel Kalia. Uh, I think it's probably, he's probably both answers, right? Cause with Daniel, I had to learn, like there was a scene that I really wanted us to like work on that shock like shock of the director writer to like pay a little closer attention to and um and and he had to focus on everything else so I remember we were about to do the scene the next day and I was like I don't think he's right yet and I talked to Daniel about it and he agreed and he was like oh I'll talk to Shaka and I was like when he was like tomorrow I was like tomorrow but we shoot it tomorrow he's like yeah sometimes when people are sometimes they can only focus on the thing that's right in front of them and you'll be able to they'll be able to hear you at that point. And I was like, okay. And so in the morning, I'm in hair and makeup. And I'm like, did, did, Shaka, did he speak to Shaka yet? Did he speak to Shaka? And then I had to say, Dominique, he said he's going to do it. Let the man do what he said he's going to do. And he did it. And we got to work it out. And so that was a, a way of like, 
it it taught me how to approach um, directors and writers at a more opportune time, I guess. You know, which is before it would have been along the lines of like the vision board and like trying to control. Like, no, I need if we get this answer now, then we'll then it'll be out the way. But no, sometimes people just need it when it's the time. Can you give me an example of a scene that you were having a really hard time cracking? Basically, you know, the actor's version of writer's block and then tell me how you overcame that challenge or what you needed to do to figure that scene out so it made sense to you. Mm, I can't even think right now. I think I feel like there's so many. Um, ultimately, when I feel like I can't crack a scene is because I'm not... I'm too afraid to advocate, I think, you know, or to just speak and ask a question. You know, uh, I think if it ever feels like that, the only way to overcome it is to talk about it. That I feel like that goes in life in general. But if there is a scene and I'm like, uh, doesn't work out, but maybe they had already decided that it was going to be blocked like this and the lights are here and the camera's here. Now you don't want to be the actor that comes in and like, that doesn't really make sense. But you have to. And if it doesn't change, that's okay. But at least you spoke about it and you don't have to go to sleep being like, did I miss a moment? Did I, could I have better whatever for the character, you know? Oh, now I'm curious. I know you said you couldn't think of any examples, but even if it's something recent like Swarm, is is there an example of a time when you you knew in your yourself that you needed clarity or needed to change something? You did find the courage to speak up and it changed the scene for yeah. the better. I mean, I think... Over, I think overall there's been so many in that. But, for example, the dancing aspect in episode two. Uh, originally, there was supposed to be two dances, the one where she's really silly, you know, about it, and then the other one where she's actually good at it. And then, at a certain point, the one where she was good at it or better at it was taken out, and I thought that it had to be back in um, because it actually contributed to the, to the storyline. You know, it would have been a plot hole because those girls were kind of, those they were bullying her. What other reason would they have to have her come along to be where she needed to be in order for the show to progress? Otherwise, if they would have just invited her out of the blue without at least her showing a confidence or showing that she can get money or whatever, then it would kind of seem like it was put on the character to do it as opposed to it coming from the character. And with the second dance, it earned her a bit more respect from the dancers to then have them invite her, which then cleared a plot, uh, cleared a potential plot hole, I think. Oh, absolutely. It's also absolutely vital to see those smaller moments of growth to ensure yes. that she keeps evolving in a way yeah. that you could believe throughout the season. And it was important to me uh, for her to be able to go, when you see the rest of the, the season, there's so many uh, levels of uh, energy, feminine, masculine energy that she incorporates in, in any character or version of herself that she's being. And I think within doing the silly dance, the silly dance and the better one, you can see that she has more autonomy and control over what she does. Otherwise, with the with the one dance, I feel like it might seem like everything is happening to her and she has no control. So she's just so unaware. But it's actually scarier that she can turn that little seductive one on and then decide, you know what, I don't want to do it like that. But now as the audience member, you're like, well, she can't do it like that. You know what I mean? So I think that's cool. Speaking about advocating for yourself, I was reading that originally you were approached for the role of Marissa, but uh -huh. it's you who pushed to play Dre instead. Yeah. So what was it about the character that inspired you to make that move? And then how would you go about convincing the creators to actually make the switch? Well, I didn't. Ha the good thing is I didn't ha have to push. It literally was like, Donald was like, if that's the role you want, that's the role you get. And that that was like, oh, wow. Because I thought, okay, maybe I'll have to audition for it. But that was the answer. And, I, and it was like, we were on the phone. So I got up to him and I was like, wait, did I get the part or did I not get the part? <laughs> Or was he just speaking? Just be, or did he say? Like it was like I was confused. Um, but I told him that he was like, "Well, why do you want that part?" And I said, "Well, as an actor, I never want to catch up to myself. You know, I don't even want to know what I'm gonna do next. Um, I think about myself as a child and watching TV and saying, I want to be a versatile actor. And what does that mean?" And I have to go to the inner child who wanted to be an actor, who watched Monster with Charlize Theron, or watched Boys Don't Cry with Hilary Swank, or, you know, or, or watched 
um, Heath Ledger as a Joker or whatever it is and wanting to do character work and finally being able to get the opportunity to do that was exciting. And it was scary. It was not an easy thing for me to do. Once I got it, I was like, oh man, what did I do? I don't even know the rest of the series. I don't know what I'm gonna do, what am I gonna do? Like, you know, and I had to journal myself and identify points that were scary to me and why. Is it a real fear to me or is it a, a social idea or social um, uh, fear that I'm putting on? Like, what is somebody else gonna perceive? What are they gonna think about me? Those type of questions. And if I, if I do that, then essentially I'm allowing myself to get imprisoned by my own artistry. And I, I could not risk the chance to do that. So I had to risk it another way. You're also a producer on this. Yes. So how did that credit come into the equation? And having come out of it now, what would you say is an important thing for you to do as a producer that you only realized because of this experience? Oh, that's good. Um, honestly, it was like Janine asking me, Janine neighbors asking me like, well, what do you need in order to do the show? And I said, I need to be a producer on the show because for me, the type of actor that I've always been, and again, I would do, I would do the same work regardless of that title, but I know that I contribute a lot to a story, to the characters. I never just care about the arc, the arc of my character. I care about the entire project. Um, and so with this one where it was really going to be Dre, Dre, Dre the whole time, then I knew that I was going to be putting in a lot of work and a lot of care and that I, that I'm deserving. I deserve it. <laughs> you know? And, and that was something that I had to like, oh, you don't want to ask that. You don't want, you know what I'm saying? Stop playing small. It's like, we have one life to live here. We might as well do it big. Do it big or go home, baby. I am so excited for people to experience uh, where you go in Swarm because, yet again, powerhouse, pitch perfect work. You are something you. else. The Ladies Night Door is always open to you. I appreciate you. Thank you. It's always so much fun to talk to you. Thank you.